Good morning. Welcome to Kezprez. We're glad that you're here. Just uh, if you're visiting with us, we're so glad. It is September. Uh, hard to believe that summer has come to such a quick conclusion. But thank you for joining us, whether you're joining us in person or online this morning. Uh, we will allow those who are here in person just a chance to, to move around and to welcome one another, which is uh, the worst time of our service for introverts. So sorry. Um, so if you see someone this morning and you're a hugger and, you're, and you see someone who's not a hugger and they put their hands up as you approach them, do not hug them. Do not hug them. Okay, uh, just a couple of, of housekeeping bits of information. Especially as we begin uh, a new church year, as it were, uh, we know the kids love to do it every week because they do up name tags, but we're going to start that again. So next Sunday morning, if you're here, just fill out a name tag so you can make someone who knows they should know your name and they just can't think of your name that they can actually look and call you by name. So that's wonderful feeling. And the other thing is, is to pick up a Bible on your way in. If you don't bring a Bible every Sunday, um, pick up one of the red Bibles on your way in. And if you didn't get one this morning already, we'll allow you time to sneak out sometime before our scripture lesson to pick up a Bible. Next week, it's uh, kickoff Sunday. So kickoff Sunday is the Sunday that we really put on a, a, a severe guilt trip on those who have been away <clears throat> and really kind of lay it on thick how much we miss you and, uh, and if you don't show up, we'll show up at your house and bring you to church. So next Sunday is kickoff Sunday. It's also potluck Sunday. So we haven't done those in a while. This is an opportunity for you to bring something uh, for the meal to share. So if you're a family of two, for example, we often say bring something for four, so more than enough to feed your family and somewhere else. If, uh, if you have some diverse background or another country or the Maritimes, you can bring something that represents your region or whatever it might be. So that's happening next Sunday. As well, Grow Kids is going to break off into two classes plus, um, plus the nursery. Uh, so that's happening next Sunday. And if you would like to help with Grow Kids, either on a Sunday morning or on a Wednesday, if you could uh, let us know. So the kickoff is on the 17th, and then we're starting a new series as well as doing uh, at the back of, or in the foyer, if you'd like to pick up a book. Um, I ordered 10. Now I can get more this week. So if they're all gone by the time you leave and you want one, simply write your name and your phone number and then just don't put a check by got a book. And then I can order more for next Sunday. So that's happening on September the 20th at 6.30 here in the foyer. And again, pick up a book. Even if you're not thinking of being part of GROW, we'd really encourage you to pick one up. Uh, we don't want to scare you with it's on evangelism because some people are terrified of it and then the other extreme people go, yeah, I know all about it. I don't need anything. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity to see how Jesus engaged the people that he came in contact with and then how we are to engage the people that we come in contact with. So that's the theme in the preaching and then on Wednesday evenings. So please do that as well. Um, for the potluck, just a, a special note that uh, we're looking for help for the kitchen. We often don't even need to ask because people just automatically go over and help. But uh, Gathering Place doesn't know this yet, but I'm going to help have you guys leave up the table set up on Thursday and we'll put some chairs around it so it'll be set up for Sunday morning. Um, but if you can help in the kitchen getting stuff organized, that would be great as well. Okay? So good, uh, good for you to be here this morning. Let's just uh, be still for a moment as we prepare our hearts for worship.
The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and he established it on the waters. Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates, and lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Let's worship him together this morning. There is a kingdom coming here today. There is a kingdom coming here today. We're waiting, we're watching, the God is alive. There is a kingdom coming here today. There is a stirring in this whole. Spirit is urging our hearts to awake. There is a story in the soul we play. Church arise. Church arise. Let your kingdom come, Father, let your will be done, on earth as heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come, Father, let your will be done, on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Let your kingdom come. Holy, holy, 
Father, let your will be done. I'm in heaven. Let it be done. Right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. God, you reign. You are robed in majesty and worship you. Here. Some of us have been doing this week in and week out for so long, it's a part of who we are, but maybe we've forgotten why we've come here. Others of us have come seeking a word of hope, a reminder that this hard time is not all there is. But as we stand here in your presence in the throne room of the King of Kings, we remember we are here to praise your name and to proclaim in the world your power and glory, to retell the stories of your righteousness and to sing of your mercy and to be reminded of your compassionate love and to once again affirm that you are our God and we are your people. And so open our eyes to your presence among us, open our hearts and our minds to hear your voice. To you alone, our God and King, belongs all glory and honor and praise, now and to the end of time. And so we pray in the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Don't sit down yet. Just... Uh... Why don't you just turn to your neighbor and say, I'm so glad that you're here this morning. Just welcome one another before you have a seat. I'll give you my mic. I'll give you my mic. That's okay. Just let me pull my sermon off. No, that's okay. No.
<laughs> okay, if the kids want to come on up, if the kids want to come on up to the front here. Okay, the, the kids want to come on up. Come on up, guys. Okay, and the rest of you, stop being so friendly. Okay, stop being so friendly. We don't want to get known as a friendly church here, so. Noah, can you show me a picture up here? About a year ago, I was told, around a year ago, we lost somebody that was very important to people. We lost the Queen of England, and we got a new king. And this is King Charles. Now, for those of us who are older than you, maybe you've sung God Save the Queen. Well, now you're going to have to sing God Save the King because we're part of the Commonwealth. So he is the King of England, but he's also a representative for us too. So we now have a new king. Now, the Bible would tell us otherwise. The Bible would say that we've had a king for all eternity. That God is king, that Jesus is king, but he doesn't wear a crown like that or a scepter or a robe like that. But Jesus is king. And sometimes we need to be reminded of that because sometimes we we think of other people as kings or sometimes we even make ourselves out to be a, a king or a queen that we want other people to serve us and take care of us and do whatever we say kind of like king charles can tell his servants of what to do but we have one king and his name is king jesus and it's his kingdom and his glory and his power. I need you to remember that this morning, okay? So let's pray before you guys go off to grow kids. We say, thank you, God, that you love us, that you are king, and that we are children of the king. In Jesus' name, amen. As the kids head out, we're going to sing them out. And I don't think we can sit singing this song. Stand up. <laughs> Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. In grace in us we pray.
morning. I'm reading from Palm, Psalms 115. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. They have mouths, but do not speak, eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear, noses, but do not touch. They have hands, but do not feel, feet, but do not walk. They make no sound in their throats. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. May the Lord be the increase, both you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any that go down into silence. The word of the Lord. Be Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the book of First Chronicles. You can find it on page 336 of your Red Bibles, First Chronicles. And I'm begin, uh, chapter 29, beginning at verse 10. First Chronicles, chapter 29, beginning with verse 10. This is God's word for us this morning. Then David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of our ancestor Israel, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, are the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty, for all that is in the heavens and on the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Riches and honor come from you, and you rule over it. In your hand are power and might, and it is in your hand to make great and to give strength to all. And now, our God, we give thanks to you and praise your glorious name. This is God's word for us this morning. May he bless it to our understanding. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'm going to date myself this morning, but I was a part of the target audience when Sesame Street first debuted in 1969. Kirk was too, I'll date him also. I am older, <laughs> just barely. <laughs> and I grew up with that song, one of these things is not like the others. I even had the little 45 for my record player. That's another way of dating myself. One of these things is not like the others. One of these things just doesn't belong. Can you tell which thing is not like the others by the time I finish my song. I was transported back to that Sesame Street moment as I was preparing for this morning because I don't know if you were paying attention, like really paying attention when we prayed the Lord's Prayer together this morning at the beginning of worship just a few minutes ago. 
and paying attention to what we have been reading as our scripture lesson for the last eight weeks from Matthew chapter 6. But one of these things is not like the others. It's the elephant in the room. And so this is the moment when we suss out that difference. So if you have your Bible, and this is why we encourage you to bring a Bible or pick one up, if you have your Bible, I'm going to get you to turn to Matthew 6 and just follow along. We're going to start, pick it up at the verse that we've been looking at the last two weeks, verse 13. And it says, And do not bring us to a time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. Which other versions of the Bible translate closer to what we say when we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil? And then what comes after the segment for today, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen, awaits not there. It's not included in the Gospel of Matthew. And if you're a keener and you're tempted to flip over to Luke 11 where the Lord's Prayer also appears, a slightly different version, let me help you out and just say it's not there either. It doesn't show up there. So what do we make of that? What do we make of that omission of the Lord's Prayer. How did that line get here, and why why do we say it? So to begin, let's go back to Matthew 6, where we find the Lord's Prayer. In fact, we could go back even further to the end of chapter 4, where we read that Jesus was traveling around the region of Galilee, traveling, teaching the good news, of the kingdom and word began to spread about him and people started bringing their sick to him for healing and so these huge crowds began to grow and they started to follow him from village to village down to ta- down to town and then on one occasion the crowd grows so large that Jesus goes up to the mountain and he begins teaching them from the mountainside And what follows is chapters 5, 6, and 7, what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Not a sermon in the way that we think of sermons today, but really a collection of sermonettes. But Jesus spent the whole day there teaching them on the mountainside, teaching them about a whole variety of topics. And right in the middle of that teaching, on all these other topics, Jesus turns his attention to the topic of prayer. Doesn't start out right away with the Lord's Prayer. First he starts talking about how we should approach the Father in prayer, what our attitude should be, the way that we should come to God in prayer. And then that leads into Jesus teaching us this way of praying, this sample prayer. He provides this prayer for us. But that prayer, as we find it in Matthew 6, it ends very abruptly. Do not lead us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. And then <clears throat> that's the end of the prayer. And Jesus picks up, he circles back to comment on something he said earlier in the prayer. He wants to flush something out a bit, clarify it. That if you forgive others their trespasses or debts, as we say, then God will forgive you. But if you don't forgive, then God won't forgive you either. And then, well, then Jesus just moves on. (laughs) He moves on to the next topic, which happens to be fasting. So if we go back to the verses of the prayer itself, in particular, verse 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, that's where it ends. It's a very awkward ending. It doesn't really feel like an ending at all. It feels unfinished. And maybe it's 
just because we've been so conditioned to expect something else to come after it, but even recognizing that and acknowledging it, to end the prayer and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, amen, feels incomplete. And so this line, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. It isn't in Jesus' original teaching. So where did it come from? Why do we say it? Let me just say, I kind of actually love that Matthew and Luke give us this snapshot of Jesus teaching on prayer in both Gospels with this abrupt, incomplete ending. You'll remember that Matthew was one of the 12 disciples, and so he was there on the mountainside that day. Luke, on the other hand, was not a part of the inner circle of the 12, but he was a Jesus follower. And in fact, he was a close companion of the Apostle Paul's. So that helps account for some of the differences in their gospel telling and also in the Lord's Prayer itself. But what I really, really appreciate is neither of them, when they are writing their Gospels, felt like they had to clean up the ending of this prayer. Neither of them felt like they had to tack something on the end to make it feel more complete. But rather, they allowed Jesus' teaching on prayer to stay true to what happened that day on the mountainside. And so because of that, we know that the changes to the Lord's Prayer, as we have it today, came sometime later, even after the Gospels were written down and recorded for us. And the earliest instances of the prayer, as we have it today, with what we might call the alternate ending, <laughs> are found in a document commonly called the Didache, which means the teaching. The actual title is translated as the Lord's teaching through the 12 apostles to the nations. And it was a document written as early as the second century. It is the oldest document of church order and practices aside from the scriptures, and it is believed to be the record of the teachings and the traditions that were handed down from those original disciples, the first disciples. And in the Didache, we find the Lord's Prayer with what we know as that last line, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever, amen, included. And so it has been handed down to us in this form from sometime around the second century. Now some biblical scholars, some commentators, write about the addition of these words, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever, amen, as simply a way to finish the prayer, to round it out, to bring it to a completion, give it a proper ending. But of course, that's not all it is. There is something more. It's not a phrase that the apostles just plucked out <laughs> of the air and made up, tacked it on the end of Jesus' prayer and called it good so that it felt finished. But the phrase itself goes all the way back to King David. And in order for us to really even grasp the meaning of the phrase, we have to go back even further because the people of God were never meant to have a king. They had a king. God was their king. His kingship was established from the very beginning. Sovereignty over not just the earth, but over the entire cosmos. You know, the makers of the James Webb Space Telescope boast that it will be able to see 
almost the entire way back to the beginning of the universe. Almost. But our God was there in the beginning. And it was established by him. He alone is sovereign over all creation. And when Israel was delivered from Egypt, where they suffered under the hand of Pharaoh, Moses sang on the shores of the Red Sea. He sang this, The Lord Yahweh will reign forever and ever. This was the song of Israel. God was their king. And so God established leaders, Moses, Joshua, and then a long line of judges. But over time, as Israel grew, as they became settled in the Promised Land, as they began to rub shoulders with other nations who had kings, Israel started to feel less than. And they became dissatisfied with an invisible God as their king. And they began to feel dissatisfied with this revolving door of judges who were appointed to rule over them. And they longed to be like their neighbors, to have a king over them. And in the opening of 1 Samuel, the people of Israel have absolutely just revolted. They're crying out, we are determined to have a king over us so that we also may be like other nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. It wasn't so much a rejection of the leaders and the judges who God had appointed over them, but it was an absolute slap in the face to God who was their king. The king who called them out not to be like other nations. A king who governed them. A king who went out before them to fight their battles. But God heard them. And he gave them a king. Many kings, actually. Kings just like the other nations. And we can relate to Israel, can't we? Because we live in a time and in a culture where kings and queens that we have made wield a lot of power and they attract a lot of attention to themselves. Some of our kings and queens are heads of state, heads of nations, And they are armed with powerful weapons, including the media. And they have access to billions and trillions of the people's dollars to spend on their exploits at the expense of the same people who are under their care. And others are made kings and queens by the power and influence of social media. Millions of people fall under their spell, throwing money at their feet, bowing down, literally, in worship. We know all the lyrics. We're wearing the shoes. We memorize the stats. We can't memorize scripture, but we can sing along to all those Taylor Swift songs. And we can regurgitate the Shohei Otani stats like that. So we attribute glory to these people and we long to come up close enough to them so that we can bask in that glory ourselves. And so in the presence of those stars, we are underwhelmed by God. And when we are underwhelmed by God, we become overwhelmed with ourselves. 
our own greatness, our own glory. We're puffing ourselves up. We become kings and queens of our own castles, of all that we are and all that we have. And it leaves little time and little room for God. Let me ask you this. When was the last time that you came into God's holy presence and you felt your heart expand out of your chest? When was the last time you stood in complete awe of his glory and majesty? That you felt the urge to lie prostrate on the ground in humility, to fall on your knees, literally get on your knees before him, just to be so caught up, so completely in awe of his glory and his majesty that you forget about yourself for a minute. But instead, we're walking in here with our sacred texts, our cell phones in our back pocket, and our communion wine, coffee, like we're walking into a Starbucks instead of coming into this house of worship where we encounter together the living God who put the very breath of life into our lungs. And so God gave Israel kings to rule over them. Some of them were good. Many of them were evil. But very few of them understood the appointment to the kingship like David did. Most of the kings were consumed with their own power, their riches, their glory. But David, for the most part... (laughs) understood his role. He was God's delegate. God knew, uh, David knew that God alone was the king. David was just a human figurehead. And David is constantly and deliberately pointing away from himself to God, putting the crown back where it belonged, back on God. And we see this all throughout the Psalms, most of which were written by David. Biblical scholars refer to these as the enthronement Psalms, where God is put back on the throne. Where David and the other writers, very purposefully, but also for their own spirituality, reinforce, remind themselves, remind their people remind us that God is king. God alone is king. God reigns. But as we've been reminded this week with the anniversary of the death of Queen Elizabeth and the handing over of the reign to King Charles, David's own time as king would come to an end and he would hand the kingship of Israel over to Solomon. And at his retirement ceremony that I read from This morning in 1 Chronicles, David gave this prayer. We only read a portion of it, but it says, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of our ancestor Israel, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, are the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Riches and honor come from you, and you rule over it all. In your hand are power and might, and it is in your hand to make great and give strength to all. And now, O God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Did you hear it? Yours is the greatness, the power, the glory. And then a few phrases later, yours is the kingdom. And that gets picked up and echoed again and again throughout both the Old and New Testament after David's acknowledgement. Men and women who encountered God as king of kings proclaim him again and again that the kingdom and the power and the glory 
belong only to him. And so the Lord's Prayer ends as it begins, glorifying God and proclaiming him as king over us. And when we pray it, we are putting God in his place, putting God in his rightful place in our world and in our lives. Thine is the kingdom, God, not mine. It is yours. And the power and the glory, they are yours, God. And we confirm this to be true as we say, Amen, which comes from the Hebrew word emet, truth. Emet, truth. And together and alone, we affirm this to be true. His is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Can I get an amen? As we respond to God's word together, as we come as a church family, as we surrender ourselves and all that we have and all that we are, trust in someone who is bigger than us, we give back to God. You are able to do so in your gifts, whether you give online or at the back in the, uh, in the offering plate. We also bring God our prayers. And this morning, our prayer team has been made aware that we've been praying for Shauna, for Cease and David, for Mackenzie, Austin, and Maverick, for Eleanor, for Steve and his mother, for Alfie and Leanne, for Wayne, for Tanaz and Navid, and for Marjorie. Are there other things you would like us to be praying for this morning? Are there other prayer requests this morning? Are there other things? Yeah. Morocco. Morocco. The recent earthquakes in Morocco. Are there other things we can be praying for this morning? Janice. For Sarah. Sandy. For Matt. Are there other things we can be praying for this morning? Yeah, Amy. For Kelly and terminal cancer. There are other things. Yeah, Chad. Audrey and the hundredth birthday. Imagine the changes that Audrey has seen in a hundred years. <coughs> other things we can be praying for this morning. Okay. So let's go to God in prayer. Let us pray. <coughs> Who are we, O oh God, that you are mindful of us? Who are we to come crawling into your throne room to meet face to face? with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who are we? But yet we are reminded that the temple veil has been torn in two. And we, broken and sinful people, are able to enter into the Holy of Holies to meet face to face with the King of Kings. Even Moses could not look upon the face of God, for he would die. For the glory of the Lord is powerful. Yet you are a God who is approachable. 
the God who we know as Jesus, the one who, who met with those who others would not speak with, who touched those who others pushed aside, who felt more comfortable with the irreligious than the religious. But God, help us even this day to have a balance of the God who is approachable, but yet the God who is all glory, who is all power. So we come not to break in to speak with you, but because you invite us into your presence. You invite us to come because you are not simply coming to us, but you have been waiting for us. That you are at the bedside of those who are in hospital this day, for those who are home and wonder about their job or their marriage or their health tomorrow, for those who are struggling with mental illness, depression, anxiety, for those who have lived through and have said goodbye to lost loved ones in earthquakes, for those who are in transition, for those who have been diagnosed with something that is terminal, for those who are celebrating the birth of a baby or a hundredth birthday, that you are there in the homes of those who are struggling in their marriages or called to care for children who are high needs. We wonder how any of us can get through tomorrow because sometimes life seems unbearable. but we know we are not alone and that you are with us. So to you we proclaim, to you be all glory and honor and praise forever and ever. Amen. A closing worship song this morning is Thine Be the Glory. It's typically an Easter hymn but um, we think it's appropriate for us this morning. I'll get Catherine to play it through and uh, then invite you to stand with us as we sing. <coughs> Yeah. 
After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshiped the God saying, Amen, praise and glory, wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Father and King and the companionship of the Holy Spirit go with us now and forevermore. Mm -hmm. 